We are at 75, so at 100 to go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the FIBA annual forum on food ed and social inclusion, titled European Food Banks Federation, Competencies and Creativity to Feed the Future. Today we have more than 160 participants, they are still coming inside, this event coming from more than 30 countries inside and outside Europe and representing food banks, academia enterprises, as well as non-profit organizations and institutions of the European Union. This event has received financial support from the European Commission and will be streamed on YouTube, Facebook and our FIBA website. In order to participate to the event in the best way, let me provide you some very brief technical information, which you already received via email. All speeches will be translated into English, German, French, Italian, Czech, and Hungarian. You can access to the selected language via the app interactive.io. We suggest you to do by your smartphone while following the interventions on your computer. The access code is FIBA 2020. At the end of the event, there will be a Q&A moment in which speakers will answer to your questions. You can write your questions during the forum in case you wanted to address a question to a specific speaker, please write his or her name including also yours and the organization you are representing. In any case, if you need further support, you can write to the email account info.eurofoodbank, info at eurofoodbank.org. And now I come to the flow of the event so we can show you the slide about the program of the event, please. Thank you. Coming to the flow of the event, we are going to listen 10 distinguished speakers who will let us get into detail with the three key words of the forum's title. The key words are competencies, creativity and future. And together with them, we will understand why these three key words are so important in this pandemic time. After the opening of the FIBA, 
president, we will have four moments. The first one will present the current situation on food insecurity and some innovative strategies and practices in food redistribution. A second moment will be devoted to the policies and funding schemes for the next year with an intervention from the European Commission. The third moment will be on urban food policy and governance requiring a more holistic approach and empowerment of citizens. And at the end, we will have a Q&A moment and some closing remarks by our president. So let's start. My name is Laura Gavinelli and I am honored to introduce Jacques van den Krieg, the president of the European Food Banks Federation for the efficient opening of the forum. Mr. President, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Laura. Ladies and gentlemen and dear food bankers, it gives me great pleasure to open this annual forum on food aid and social inclusion. This event follows the first one held in the European Parliament on 18 November 2019. It was two months before the world learned to spell a now famous alphanumeric acronym, COVID-19. Last year, the focus on the annual forum was mainly on the current food and material assistance provided to the most deprived persons in the framework of the Fund for European Aid to the Most Deprived, FEAD in other words. It was also concentrating on the future of the European Social Fund Plus and its support to address the material deprivation in the new multi-annual financial framework 2021-2027. I am speaking under correction of Mr. Loris Di, Piet Di Pietro Antonio from the European Commission as this subject appears to be still in discussion, as it seems to be very difficult to reach an agreement in the trilogue between Council, Parliament and Commission, especially as regards to thematic concentration. Unfortunately, the coronavirus disease has its own pace and has catch up on all of us. I would first like to remember the 1.6 million persons who lost their lives due to the pandemic and to the 50 million plus who were or are badly affected by the disease. May the soul of those who died rest in peace and the health of those who fight the disease improve and be restored. A particular salute to those unsung heroes who lost their lives while serving others. 2020 will certainly be remembered by history as the year of the pandemic. Another episode in the history of public health crisis. We have lived and worked with the impact of COVID-19 and we will live and work with the aftershocks and the socioeconomic consequences of the pandemic. Whilst COVID-19 has had disastrous consequences on many communities and beneficial impact on events such as presidential elections, COVID-19 also has an amazing impact on solidarity and empathy. Since the start of the pandemic, our Federation has launched a drive to fundraise 10 million euros for the purpose of assisting our members meeting their most urgent needs and securing their activity. Rather than being directive, we have left it to the various national organizations to select the most efficient way to address the challenges that COVID-19 brought to their communities. As a result, we have registered a fantastic surge 
in creativity in many diverse fields. New initiatives have taken place and very remarkably in countries where food banks have been of relatively recent introduction. We estimate that the food demand has increased by an average of 30% at European level compared to, the, to 2019. The range is obviously very wide. It goes from six to 90% across Europe. Most demands have been met thanks to the overall solidarity and creativity in 2020. I would like to stress once again, the guiding values and principles of our organization, which is based on donation and sharing, as it is clearly stated in our charter that has been reviewed and approved by our General Assembly earlier today. It is a, measure, a pleasure for me that today we are releasing a new report highlighting the challenges and the responses to COVID-19 as well as telling good stories from our members. Never before have we heard and seen food insecurity in the media as today, even in Europe. The people queuing to collect food to feed their family is a sight that we hoped never to see again. <coughs> Today, the attention of media and the broader public on food insecurity, a topic which is at the heart of our daily action, together with food waste prevention, must relaunch our commitment. We must take this window of opportunity to make the case for the actions of food bank with the local, the regional, the national uh, and European authorities, as well as international organizations. We will use this opportunity to stress our role, of course, but also to contribute to the necessary holistic approach to improve the food system and preserve the planet resources for a greater efficiency and better health for all, especially the most disadvantaged. This crisis can be a precious opportunity that can take us back to the roots of solidarity in Europe and also the roots of our mission, our daily activity in Europe. Like the trees, food banks are living beings, made possible by tens of thousands of people every day. And they are growing through adversity because they are giving back to the community more than what they receive. Through food redistribution, food banks prevent food waste, improving the resilience of the food supply chain, helping our planet and contributing to food security. The activity of food banks is a real example of circular economy and its outcome goes far beyond the starting point. I would like to conclude my introduction with a real appreciation to the speakers and attendees alike. We are fortunate to welcome most distinguished speakers from very different horizons and backgrounds. Thank you to our staff and to the moderator for having organized this annual forum attended by people from all over the world. May this annual forum help us all improving food aid, developing our competencies and stimulating our creativity. Back to you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, for your really inspiring uh, opening uh, of this important event. And now it's the moment to introduce the, fir the first of the four moments uh, I described to you in the flow of the program. So the first moment uh, will be um, presented by six people 
a keynote speaker, and then five food bankers. If I should title this first moment, I would say that probably this intervention will help us to understand what is happening. What about the current situation in terms also of innovative strategies and practices? But let's start with Professor Veronica Toffolutti. I welcome you. Uh, you are the first speaker. Uh, Veronica Toffolutti is a research fellow in health economics at the Bocconi University, Italy. And the title of her intervention, as you can see, is, is a COVID-19 pandemic turning into a European crisis, food crisis? The floor is yours and welcome again. Thank you so much, Laura, and uh, apologies for the delay, a technical glitch. I joined Mr. President, I acknowledge all of you for organizing this event. It's a great pleasure and honor to have the opportunity to share some of my work. And I would also acknowledge all the food bankers for the amazing work that they are doing, especially right now. So let's start. On the 20th of February, 2020, the first case of the novel coronavirus, COVID-19 subsequently called, was di first diagnosed and detected in Codogno, close to Milan, north of Italy. Italy then was the first Western European country, Western country in general, to be hit, hardly hit by the novel pandemic. And soon afterwards, this uh, news, many Italians began to stockpiling food and pictures of uh, nearly empty ale, supermarket ales were posted among the social medias. But Italians were not the only ones. Actually, as soon as the news spread across the world, most of the European countries had the same effect. These graphs present you a new evidence from Spain, a recent published paper on Spain that shows the peak in hoarding the supermarkets as soon as the news of the detection of new viruses of the new uh, coronavirus was detected in Spain. So on the 30th of March, the Pope, Pope Francis, during the Angelus said, we are at the beginning of seeing people who are hungry because they cannot work. And actually the COVID-19 and the lockdown itself has placed the global economy under a tremendous trend, but they are only worsening something that was already existing, food insecurity. This is probably the easiest slide that I'm gonna present because you all know what food security or insecurity is, but let me remind you this concept, even though probably it's superfluous, uh, according to the FAO definition, a food security is a situation in which all people at all times has physical, social, and economic access to nutritious food, uh, safe and nutritious food, which meets uh, their dietary needs and food preference for an active and healthy life. So, so this... Uh, Decide the, these and decide the fact that uh, the United Nations set the right for food. Currently, none of the European countries has a food monitoring system. And previous research, mainly based on data that are produced by food banks, show that the, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, the Great Recession, an additional 13.5 million of European households were tipped into food insecurity. These, uh, um, crisis is supposed to be and is already being much deeper and expected to be much longer. The previous evidence show that in uh, the December of 2018, 46 million of Europeans didn't have access to enough nutrition food. But this was not evenly distribution across the socioeconomic status. And most of the evidence come from the United States, one of the leading countries in terms of food monitoring. The United States has shown that the houses that have been headed by single women and or black and Latinos are more likely to be affected. So food insecurity is not 
um, um, equally distributed across the socioeconomic status, but it also represents a valuable point of entry for understanding the social exclusion and the material deprivation. In this picture, I present a research from the United States, where, which show the increase in terms of food insecurity due to the novel coronavirus. And specifically, it compares from data starting from the 2000s. In this research, Jim Ziliak showed that the food insecurity tripled over the um, COVID outbreak, but the largest um, to be affected are households uh, headed by Black or Latino people. Similar evidence has been found by you guys, by the European Food Bank Association, which show in three different reports that even though all the food banks uh, um, were working, there is being a significant increase in the number of people that were assisted by going between 80 and 90, uh, 90%. So here in my research, I found that there are two interlinked threats to food security. The first one is the food shortage triggered by price rises. And the second one is the unequal distribution of food. Um, turning to the first uh, um, threat, the production of some food production has been slowed and some have been halted altogether. If you remind yourself in the, early beginning of the lockdown, the borders were closed and it put a, a lot of strain on the, for the agricultural economy. For example, countries such as the country where I'm speaking from, Italy, relies on 25%, one quarter of its production, relies on uh, pickers uh, coming mainly from Eastern Europe. When the borders were closed, the production was halted altogether. And uh, the Italian Association for Agriculture plead the international organization to open the borders so the crops wouldn't stand still in the fields. Same requirement came from other countries such as Germany, uh, France, and the Netherlands. This is coming in a period in which the agricultural workforce is declining and getting older. Only 11% of the agricultural workforce is below the age of 40. And this is impressive. At the same time, this um, um, is uh, combined with a shift in the food consumption. When the coronavirus outbreak, the, food, the consumption of food moved from um, large catering, schools, or bar and restaurant to home. And so people start producing their own food. But that led also to a stark increase of some uh, food, uh, uh, some prices of some food. For example, raw materials such as wheat and rice that are the raw materials for pasta and long life products in general, um, increased massively between 15 and 20%. And this led to a decrease of the supplies because some countries decided to stop the exportation of that to safeguard their own requirement. At the same time, other products such as dairy plunge all together because the schools were closed. So the other threat that I mentioned is the unequal distribution of food. As the Pope mentioned, only those who can afford food had the opportunity to have. In this graph, I present a, a new evidence from a research that I'm working on, in which I compare the um, food insecurity measure as the uh, prevalence of people that cannot access food because they don't have enough money or the food is not available between April and July. This data comes from a large data set from the UK called Understanding Society. And we can see that this is a, a huge increase in the percentage. Those are the same people in April and July. And those are unadjusted, so we don't control for individual characteristics, but here we control for individual characteristics using probability weights. What I would like to stress you is in this slide is that this didn't come just equally across the socioeconomic groups, but comes in differently according to the employment status. For example, for the people who stay in employment, the increase was uh, minimal. 
and also for those who have been far. The UK implemented the so-called coronavirus job scheme, so people that uh, uh, were not able to go to work were furloughed, meaning that uh, they keep their jobs and the government supplement 80% of their salary. But the massive increase was among those who end up being out of labor or being unemployed. Is there any solution to this um, problem? We, uh, I mean, in my research, I propose several ways to put a solution to this. And one is, for example, creating a new called New Deal for Europe. First of all, I would say that most of the emphasis would be on the social policies to encourage employment, to save uh, the employment of the people as well as the social safety net. But in terms of food, which is the main argument of this talk is a kind of important reduce the food supply chain, the so-called farm to fork. This would have two beneficial effects. On the one hand, it would increase the quality of the food because it would reduce the industrialized um, level of the food and so the super processed food. At the same time, it would also make us less uh, um, dependent on international food, and meaning that in uh, cases such as these, we wouldn't have lost so much food. The second evidence is on the agriculture workforce. We, as uh, Western Europeans, realize that how much we are dependent on Eastern European pickers. And uh, a way to do that is um, designed the workers as frontline. At the moment, the Western Europeans are not working in workforce because the wages are very low and the taxation is very high. One way to solve this is to increase their salary, uh, salary by decreasing the taxation. And this can be done as um, appointing them as frontline workers. This would uh, eventually lead to not an increase in the food prices. So to conclude my talk, I would give you a, a sentence in which uh, I try to summarize what I found in my research, that the COVID pandemic is an opportunity to rethink uh, the agricultural system in Europe, especially the European Union common agricultural policy that underpins this. And this is an opportunity that not uh, must be missed. This is my context. Obviously, this is um, a project is uh, just a part of uh, different projects that I'm working on. And I would like to, in this occasion to acknowledge some of my collaborators and some of my mentors that helped me through the way. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Tofolutti, for your brilliant and crystal clear uh, presentation. You provided us a, a very clear and not only a worrying scenario, because you also provided some solutions and some ways to, to exit this uh, dramatic period. You provided some very interesting information on food shortage and unequal distribution as a first uh, passage uh, during your presentation, which is connected with different social and economic categories, for example, black and Latino people or unemployed people. That's really, really great. And, and also you provide some information about farm to fork model as a possible solution to boost, to foster a higher quality of food and a more sustainable supply chain in the food industry. And uh, uh, as a last uh, suggestion, uh, uh, thinking also about uh, the frontline workers uh, coming from the Western European, European regions, uh, you uh, concluded with uh, a very uh, important suggestion, which is rethink the agricultural system in Europe. So I think it's a, an excellent starting point from which we can uh, proceed with the five uh, food bankers uh, uh, just to go into detail with the practices, so with the applications in terms of innovation and new strategies to foster, to face the challenges uh, of COVID-19. So thank you very much again. And so here we are. We are uh, at a um, virtual round table with the five uh, food uh, members of the FIBA networks. 
coming from different countries. Uh, I will introduce one after the other. Uh, just a, a technical information for uh, the, the five uh, speakers. Uh, don't hate me, just to spend the time in the right way. You know that you've got five minutes each one per presentation. So after two minutes, I will show you this one. <laughs> don't hate me. And uh, after four minutes, I will show you this one. This means uh, the last minute for you. So, so thank you very much for the collaboration. And I start by introducing uh, the first uh, speaker, who is Paola Capodistrias. Paola is the project manager of uh, the food banks uh, in Norway. And she will provide us uh, two cases of innovative strategies in the Norwegian food banks. Welcome, Paola. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes, uh, thank you Feba also for uh, organizing this event uh, and thank you uh, Professor Tofeluti for uh, such an inspiring way to, to start this day. Um, and it's very appropriate because uh, indeed now we're going we're gonna to talk about some of the opportunities that came on this crisis. Um, as as uh, you have already said, the outbreak of this pandemic earlier this year caused a dramatic increase in availability of uh, surplus food. This was also the case for Norway. Um, with restrictions such as school closings, interruptions of tourism, cancellation of events, and adoption of home office for those that could work from home, large volumes of food originally destined for commercial and institutional kitchens became at risk of becoming food waste. Um, for the network of Norwegian food banks, this meant breaking all records in regards to volume of food rescue, reaching a peak of 77% 77, 77 more food rescued in March 2020 compared to the same month last year. At the same time, with the temporary closure of soup kitchens and other food serving initiatives, nonprofit organizations helping people in need struggle to find ways to reach out to and keep up with the increasing demand for food assistance. To be able to make the most out of these large scale food products and at the same time help the organizations reach out to people in need, we launched what we call Mat Central and Kitchen. This is a project where we turn surplus food destined to commercial kitchens into nutritious ready-made meals. Um, in order to do this, we partner with a local organization that works with employment integration. This organization has a professional kitchen where people get the opportunity to gain work experience by running catering services, for example. Unfortunately, these services also go, got affected by the pandemic and the organization found itself with human resources, with facilities, and especially experience uh, that we realized that we could put in good use. The way the project works is very simple. Uh, the organization picks up the surplus food from the food bank, makes and packs the meals uh, at their kitchen, <clears throat> sorry, and brings them back uh, to the food bank where the organizations can pick up the food that they need. Um, the project is now launched in one city in Oslo, and we are already looking at possibilities to replicate it in Trondheim, but the idea is to produce a manual so that all of our seven food banks uh, can implement this in, if needed. Um, what is fantastic about this project is that not only can we make good use of food destined to commercial kitchens, but we can also use Mat Central and Kitchen as a way to extend the shell life of food received by the food banks. Um, for example, the kitchen can use fruits and vegetables that maybe don't look that great, uh, but are still delicious and are still nutritious in a meal uh, that can also later be frozen. Um, this way we can rescue more food from becoming food waste and help more people in need, especially those that might not have an access to a kitchen or possibilities to making a meal. Um, the other project I wanted to mention is also related to the increase in surplus food available as a result of these restrictions. Um, in the past, our food banks try to avoid food waste when making sure that they didn't accept more food that they could actually redistribute to the charities. This unfortunately meant that sometimes the food banks had to renew, reduce, um, sorry, refuse a donation offer. This all changed with our new system of internal transport. So basically the food banks can now accept more, uh, more donations that are offered to them, even if these are large volumes because they can be redistributed to other food banks. Uh, this, in addition to increasing our capacity to receive surplus food, also helps us offer a better variety of food in all of our food banks. 
Um, so to wrap up, uh, I, I was uh, thinking of a quote of uh, Albert Einstein, in the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. Uh, and that was the case for the Norwegian food banks. Um, thanks to also multi-level cooperation, innovation, and uh, very especially uh, generous support from not just the food industry and foundations, but also the FEBA emergency fund. Um, thanks to, to all of these, these two projects helped us rescue even more food and reach out even more people during these challenging times. Thank you. Thank you, Paula, very much for uh, your uh, really interesting and innovative uh, uh, example on how to uh, synergize uh, between different uh, subjects uh, in order to, to make more efficient and also more effective uh, what you already do. So really, really uh, inspiring example. By the way, as you have a glimpse on what is happening uh, on the, the, the principal uh, screen, you see that something is happening. What is happening? We have uh, a graphic recorder who is Mrs. Marielle Binken, who is helping us to uh, sketch down, to, 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 yes, to, to, to have a, a direct glimpse on what we are listening to. At the very end of this event, we will have the chance to have a, a total glimpse, complex glimpse on what we have heard till then. So thank you very much also to Marielle and uh, to Paula for her first introduction. And now it is the moment of the second uh, food banker, Marco Lucchini. Marco Lucchini is Secretary General of the Fondazione Banco Alimentare Onlus uh, in Italy. He will provide us uh, in his uh, five minutes uh, three best practices on how to, to, to collaborate with commercial caterings, uh, with the municipal operational centers, as well as with a specific charity. So welcome also to you, Marco. The floor is yours. Just an information, he will uh, speak in Italian, so please uh, switch to Buongiorno a tutti. the application for the interpretation. Buongiorno a tutti, grazie per eh, avermi dato la possibilità di fare questo intervento. Certo l'emergenza sanitaria che si è abbattuta sull'Italia ha avuto forti ripercussioni sull'economia, ma trasformandosi fin da subito anche in una crisi sociale. I piccoli commercianti o gli artigiani hanno dovuto chiudere le loro attività, mentre molti tra impiegati e lavoratori a tempo determinato o con attività saltuarie si sono dovuti fermare. In questo periodo difficile la rete Banco Alimentare ha continuato la sua opera quotidiana di recupero e ridistribuzione di eccedenze alimentari. Nonostante questa catena di solidarietà ha rischiato e rischia ancora ogni giorno di non riuscire a soddisfare il crescente bisogno. Infatti, Secondo i dati raccolti dalla rete Banco Alimentare in Italia, da marzo ad oggi la richiesta di aiuti alimentari pervenuta alle 7.500 strutture convenzionate con la nostra rete da febbraio è aumentata di circa il 40% su tutto il territorio nazionale, con picchi anche del 70% in alcune regioni del sud. I dati documentano anche che il 77% delle famiglie già fragili ha visto ridurre la propria disponibilità economica e di queste il 64% ha ridotto proprio l'acquisto di beni alimentari. La rete Banco Alimentare è oggi convenzionata con 8.000 strutture caritative che raggiungono 2 milioni e 100 mila persone in difficoltà rispetto alle 1.500.000 persone che aiutava nel 2019. Ora farò qualche esempio di come abbiamo operato nei mesi più difficili e anche attualmente. Il primo esempio è relativo alla chiusura improvvisa della ristorazione commerciale nel mese di aprile, che ha generato importanti volumi di cibo in eccedenza. Le principali catene della ristorazione commerciale hanno contattato immediatamente la rete Banco Alimentare e nell'arco di pochi giorni, 15 giorni, abbiamo raggiunto circa 200 negozi 
oltre alle loro piattaforme logistiche. Il cibo era fresco e sul gelato, quindi la rete Banco Alimentare ha garantito che la catena del freddo non si interrompesse, in modo da far arrivare il cibo alle associazioni perfettamente sano. Alla fine abbiamo recuperato più di 50 tonnellate di cibo. Un secondo esempio riguarda i volontari. Nei mesi di lockdown totale, il problema più grave fu l'impossibilità di ricevere aiuto quotidiano da molti nostri volontari, in quanto ho oltre 65 anni ho impossibilitati a uscire dai confini del proprio comune e raggiungere quindi la sede del Banco Alimentare. La situazione si era aggravata poiché anche molti volontari delle associazioni che aiutiamo erano impossibilitati a muoversi e molte di queste decisero anche di chiudere. Al fine di sopperire alla mancanza di volontari, la collaborazione tra la rete Banco Alimentare e i comuni, in particolare dove esistevano delle politiche del cibo, come la Milano Food Policy, la protezione civile, la società di ristorazione, i mercati generali, le società di trasporto pubblico, Caritas Italiana, Croce Rossa, ha permesso di attivare quelli che in Italia si chiamano i centri operativi comunali, così da centralizzare la filiera degli aiuti alimentari e in questo modo raggiungere le molte persone sempre più sole che chiedevano aiuto. Un'altra cosa positiva è stato che molti giovani si resero disponibili a consegnare gli aiuti alimentari e questo aiutò a rispondere con prontezza alla crescente richiesta di cibo, anche da persone che mai avevano chiesto aiuto fino allora. Il terzo esempio riguarda il progetto Sostegno straordinario, fortemente innovativo e a carattere nazionale, che ha visto la collaborazione della rete Banco Alimentare Italiana grazie a un contributo di Banco BPM insieme a Caritas. L'obiettivo era garantire le condizioni di sussistenza essenziale a numerose famiglie in difficoltà, con particolare attenzione alle fasce più deboli, dove c'erano anziani e bambini. Dieci Caritas diocesane hanno raccolto le necessità alimentari per garantire 1.250 spese mensili in dieci città, dal nord al sud. Successivamente è stato stabilito un paniere per una spesa settimanale e l'impegno a garantire alle famiglie la spesa per due mesi. La rete Banco Alimentare aveva il compito di recuperare, quindi non acquistare, generi alimentari per un valore di 250.000 euro in modo da garantire la varietà e la quantità di prodotti del paniere per due mesi. Il progetto ha consentito di supportare attraverso le sedi di Caritas e Banco Alimentare parrocchi, centri di ascolto e impori solidari. Oltre 2.000 famiglie con più di 3.000 minori. Il risparmio ottenuto dalle 10 Caritas diocesane, non dovendo acquistare il cibo, ha permesso di attivare un sostegno al reddito per altre 900 famiglie. Concludo volendo ringraziare tutto lo staff della Rete Banco Alimentare, le organizzazioni non profit, le istituzioni pubbliche, nazionali ed europee che hanno supportato il nostro lavoro in questi mesi. E un grazie particolare al Presidente della FEBA, al Segretario Generale e al suo staff per la concreta e instancabile vicinanza mostrata alla nostra rete. E auguro anche un buon Natale e un ricco 2021 di bellissime sorprese. Thank you, Marco Lucchini, for the greetings. Uh, we will, of course, uh, we wish you, to you and to your organization the same. A uh, very luck uh, new year. And thank you also for your presentation. You provided us uh, three examples uh, on how your uh, consolidated operations uh, can engage new partners, new players, uh, due to the increasing uh, food demand. Uh, you well uh, explained that uh, since uh, last February, the food demand increased the passing from four, plus 40% uh, to even plus 70% in the southern part of Italy. And so you engaged commercial caterings, uh, volunteers, but also banks uh, and uh, uh, commercial activities. So thank you very much for providing these examples. Now we pass uh, to the third food banker, Balash Che. Uh, Balash Che, who is president of Magyar um, Food Bank of Hungary, 
and uh, he will uh, speak in Hungarian. So please uh, switch to the interpretation to the application. You're very welcome, Balasha. The floor is yours. Salam szépen, és uh, először is ez egy különleges alkalom számomra, mert uh, 14 éve már a különböző élelmiszerbankos nemzetközi találkozókra, de ez az első alkalom, hogy magyarul szólalhatok meg, úgyhogy uh, ez, egy, ez egy ritkaság, és legalább így a, a közönség is egy kicsit uh, élvezheti a magyar nyelv szépségeit is. Um, Amiről szeretnék beszélni, az, az egy, egy olyan speciális projekt, amely Magyarországon valósult meg a, a COVID járvány időszaka alatt. Az Agrárminisztérium, az élelmiszerbankok, illetve élelmiszer feldolgozó vállalatok közreműködésével. Amikor a, a járvány Magyarországon is az első hulláma kitört, akkor ahhoz hasonlóan, amit Márko Lukin is említett, nagyon sok területen láttunk olyan fajta volatilitást, ahol nem várt élelmiszer feleslegek keletkeztek. Ilyen volt például a vendéglátásnak a területe, ahol ugye szállodák, rendezvényszervező cégek, éttermek kellett, hogy hirtelen egyik napról a másikra bezárjanak, és ezért sok felesleges élelmiszer alapanyag maradt náluk. Ilyen, ilyen volt például az iskolák területe, ahol az iskolai bezárások miatt azok a, azok a beszállítások, például iskola gyümölcs, iskola tej programok álltak le egyik napról a másikra, ahol szintén bentragadt készletek voltak, és ezeket szerencsére az élelmiszerbank segítségével nélkülözőknek tudtuk eljuttatni. De ilyen volt a húsvéti, húsvéti kereskedelemnek a megtorpanása, ahol már nagyon sok élelmiszert berendeltek a kereskedők, de ezek nem fogytak el a boltokban, és ezért a húsvét előtt és ut- utáni időszakban nagyon sok készletet kaptunk az élelmiszer kereskedelmi vállalatoktól. De nagyon sok élelmiszer feldolgozó téget érintettek, exporttal kapcsolatos korlátozások is, illetve a felvevő piacuknak a változása, a beszűkülése, megszűnése is. Ugye ez egyrészt az élelmiszerbank életére is hatással volt közvetlenül, másrészt pedig nyilván itt az élelmiszer feldolgozó szektornak ez egy gazdasági problémát is jelentett, amelyet a magyar kormányzat igyekezett kezelni. Ugye nagyon sok országban olyan gazdaságvédelmi csomagok indultak el, amelyek a, a hátrányosan érintett gazdasági szereplőknek a gazdasági megsegítését jelozták. Magyarországon azért volt ez a, ebben a szegmensben egy, egy kicsit különleges a program, mert a gazdasági célkitűzéseket összekötött, sikerült összekötni szociális célkitűzéseknek a megvalósításával. Hiszen csak úgy, mint nagyon sok országban, Magyarországon is természetesen sokkal több rászoruló van, nagyon sokan elvesztették a munkájukat, ezért megnövekedett az igény az élelmiszer adományokra. Az a program, amit a, a, az Agrár, Agrár Minisztériummal, illetve a, a Magyar Agrár Kamarával közösen sikerült kialakítani, arról szól, hogy élelmiszer feldolgozó vállalatok, kormányzati támogatásban részesültek, anyagi támogatásban, melyel meg tudtak tartani munkahelyeket. Viszont ennek a támogatásnak egy részét, egész pontosan a támogatás értékének a 10%-át, ezeknek a feldolgozó vállalatoknak élelmiszer adomány formájában vissza, kell, vissza kellett, illetve vissza kell adniuk a magyar társadalom részére. A Összesen egyébként több mint száz ilyen élelmiszer feldolgozó vállalat rült be a programba, és annak, a, annak az élelmiszer támogatásnak az, ért, az értéke, amit ez a száz vállalat nyújt, ez körülbelül 2 millió euró összességében, és ezt a 2 millió euró értékű élelmiszert részben az élelmiszerbank, részben pedig más nagy karitatív szervezetek jut 
látják el nélkülözőknek, ami ez az eljutás, ez már jelenleg is zajlik, illetve ez még, ez még megtörténni fog jövő év során is. Tehát különösen a téli időszakban, amely a nélkülözők életében egy különösen nehéz időszak, ez egy nagyon nagy többlet segítséget fog nyújtani számukra, mert ugye amikor a hűtőszámlák is megemelkednek, a rezsiköltségek megemelkednek, akkor különösen nagy segítség van az élelműszer segélyekre. Azt gondoljuk egyébként, hogy a konkrét segítségen túlmenően azért példaértékű ez a program, mert, mert sikerült terület, egyrészt a kormányzat, vállalatok és civil szervezetek között kialakítani egy együttműködést, ráadásul több különböző kormányzati terület egymással együttműködve tudott létrehozni egy programot, tehát az agrár tárca, illetve a szociális tárca tudott úgy együttműködni, ami azt gondoljuk, hogy egy nagyon előremutató dolog, hiszen például az élelmiszer, az élelmiszer segélyprogram területén is hasonló módon szükség lenne az együttműködésre a hulladék gazdálkodás, a fenntarthatóság, a szociális téma, illetve az élelmiszerlánknak az együttműködésére, és bízunk benne, hogy ez, ami, ez, ami itt nálunk történt, ez egy jó példa, és más területeken is fogunk hasonló együttműködéseket látni a jövőben. Köszönöm szépen! Thank you, Balash. Very... So, nice. Thank you, Balash, for your uh, very clear presentation. Uh, you, you provided another perspective, uh, so another practice, uh, um, equally innovative, uh, because you explained us uh, how to transform a sudden surplus of food uh, coming from the Oreca channel, as well as from schools uh, and educational institutions, and how to transform it into an opportunity. And you did it in a sort of pilot project, which will continue also in the next year, collaborating with the government, with the food producers, and also with charities. It was really interesting to see how the government, especially the Ministry of Agriculture, provided uh, this financial support also for food producers. Uh, and that's why it's so important to collaborate also at different levels. Uh, so from the private sectors uh, coming also to the public administrations at all stages. So thank you very much. Let me remind you how to use uh, the application of Interactio, because uh, probably some of you um, had some problems with that. Uh, you, you can uh, connect to the Interactio.io. You can uh, download the application. By entering, uh, you have to look uh, for uh, the event, uh, which is uh, Code Access FIBA 2020, Once entered, you can select the language you want to, um, in which you want to listen to the presentation. That's the case also for the th uh, for the next uh, presentation because we've got uh, um, Veronica Lakova, who is a CEO of uh, uh, the Food Bank of Czech Republic. So thank you very much for coming and for being with us. She will provide us an example of collaboration with the public authority at national level. So she will speak in Czech language. Uh, please use the interpreters in case of need. You're very welcome. The floor is yours. Dobrý den. Uh... Pěkné poledne přeji všem, doufám, že mě dobře slyšíte. I já mám dnes poprvé šanci mluvit ve svém rodném jazyce na fóru Feby a jsem za to velmi ráda. Tak jako mluvili mý kolegové o situacích ve svých zemích v souvislosti s koronavirem i v mé zemi samozřejmě ta situace byla velmi těžká. Já bych ráda rozdělila tu naší práci a to, co jsme v souvislosti s celou situací dělali, na dvě etapy. Zatímco jaro, kdy byly velké lockdowny a celé země byly uzavřeny, tak u nás bylo ve znamení, u nás v potravinových bankách v Čechách bylo hlavně ve znamení přebytků, distribuce a obrovské práce s čerstvými potravinami. 
Jedna z velkých aktivit, které se nám povedlo nastartovat hned dva dny po uzavření škol, které nastalo 11. března, byla spolupráce s Ministerstvem zemědělství, kdy jsme byli v podstatě v 8.40 hodinách osloveni a odsouhle a vzájemně jsme si odsouhlasili spolupráci na distribuci školního programu Mléko, ovoce a zelenina do škol. A v tu chvíli byly potravinové banky oprávněnými příjemci tohoto programu a byly schopni a měli tu možnost jej distribuovat mezi širokou veřejnost. To znamená nejen mezi ty, kteří měli potřebu, kteří byli v nějaké nouzi, ale i seniorům v karanténě nebo rodinám, které zůstaly doma s malými dětmi. Tato kooperace byla velice, velice rychlá, stejně tak jako naše logistika. A my jsme byli schopni během tří týdnů distribuovat až ke konečným odběratelům přes 300 tun ovoce, zeleniny a mléčných výrobků. Pro nás to byla velmi nová situace, velmi velká výzva, protože jsme nebyli, nebyli jsme do té doby zvyklí na tak veliký obrat čerstvého, čer, čerstvých potravin a velmi nám v tom pomohla i aktivita místních autorit, to znamená obcí a měst, kteří vlastně opět ve velmi v řádech hodin, ve velmi krátkém čase byli schopni aktivizovat dobrovolné hasiče, dobrovolníky, komunitní centra a byli schopni nám pomoci s distribucí přímo až ke konečnému odběrateli. Opravdu fyzicky rozváželi po domácnostech ovoce, zeleninu, mléčné výrobky tak, aby nemuseli být likvidovány a aby našli své místo, aby byly využity. Podobná situace se pak opakovala i na podzim, kde už těch potravin bylo sice méně, nicméně i přesto tam bylo dalších zhruba 100 tun. To znamená, že se nám v rámci této kooperace a v rámci tohoto programu se nám povedlo distribuovat zhruba 400 tun čerstvých potravin ve velmi, velmi krátkém čase. Další důležitou součástí naší práce za doby koronaviru bylo poskytnutí možnosti darování restauracím a v naše, naší zemi zejména školním jídelnám. Opět ve chvíli, kdy se uzavřely restaurace a uzavřely se školy, potravinové banky okamžitě vydaly tiskovou zprávu, že jsou ochotní a schopni přijmout a svést jakékoliv množství potravin, které je v pořádku a distribuovat ho lidem v nouzi. Uh, opět na jaře bylo na to obrovský ohlas, protože samozřejmě restaurace ani školní jídelny nebyly připraveny uh, na tuto situaci a velmi, uh, velmi rychle se nám povedlo rozvést desítky dalších tun jídla. Uh, Bohužel ta situace byla pak v, o, mnohem náročnější na podzim, e, ne snad proto, že by ta spolupráce nefungovala tak dobře, ale hlavně proto, že oproti jaru nám až v některých regionech až o 70% stoupla poptávka po potravinové pomoci. E, samozřejmě tuto poptávku jsme nebyli, nebyli absolutně schopni zvládnout, protože, jak již jsem o tom mluvila, tak e, ten první půl rok se týká zejména čerstvých potravin. E, během několika týdnů se naše sklady téměř vyprázdnily, ale opět nám velmi pomohla veřejnost, velmi nám pomohli partneři. Jistě jako ve většině států byla zrušená jarní potravinová sbírka, pomohly nám obchodní řetězce, které nám darovaly obrovské množství jídla a závěrem celé té úžasné solidární, solidární vlny byla potravinová sbírka, která proběhla letos na podzim a vybralo se v ní dvakrát více než kdy jindy. Ta prezentace toho problému, ta prezentace té potravinové nouze, která stoupá, která se prohlubuje a ještě pravděpodobně nějakou dobu se prohlubovat bude, ale za to očekávat, směrem k veřejnosti se pojila i s prezentací naší práce a opravdu jsme se setkali s tím, že veřejnost i státní orgány, státní spolupráce, vládní orgány na to reagovaly a ocenili tu práci, kterou děláme a vlastně ještě připojili k té podpoře, té podpoře toho veřejného prostoru, připojili ještě i finanční podporu, takže ve spolupráci s Ministerstvem zemědělství jsme vlastně jako 
Dalo by se říct, že je to určitá forma poděkování, ale samozřejmě celá ta práce byla i finančně náročná, takže se nám povedlo získat ještě finanční dotaci od Ministerstva zemědělství, která se pojí čistě k naší činnosti. Třetím velmi důležitým kanálem nebo startem nebo zdrojem potravin, který vlastně se objevil nebo se povedlo nastavit v letošním roce, je spolu, mezinárodní spolupráce. My jsme ve spolupráci s Německou republikou, s německými táfly zahájili přeshraniční podporu potravinové pomoci. To znamená, že pokud přebývají nějaké potraviny na německé straně v táfle Sachsen, jsou převezeny na stranu Českou a okamžitě distribuovány. Krásné na tom je to, že již nyní je v jednání a pro leden už připravujeme podobný program s rakouským, s výdeňským táflem a tam zase to půjde na druhou stranu, to znamená některé, některý typ potravin, který je v přebytku v České republice, se bude posouvat do rakouského, do výdeňského táflu. Myslím si, že přeshraniční spolupráce a vzájemná výměna té potravinové pomoci je velkou cestou, jak zlepšit portfolio a usnadnit ten přístup k širokému spektrum potravin na obou stranách hranice. Já bych ráda také využila příležitosti a poděkovala uh, jednak Febě za podporu v těch těžkých uh, časech, které letos byly a jednak samozřejmě všem těm, kteří nám pomáhali, uh, těm partnerům, kteří s námi byli uh, v době té uh, koronakrize, protože ta spolupráce byla neuvěřitelná a to bylo na úrovni ministerstev a nebo na úrovni neziskových orda- organizací, měst, obcí a těch, který, kteří nám pomáhali distribuovat. Děkuji za váš čas a přeju krásný zbytek dne. Thank you very much also to you, Veronika Kova. Uh, in this case, uh, you explain very well how to, to provide a very fast and uh, uh, effective uh, uh, response to uh, um, challenging situations and you also provided some info and some uh, expertise about how to cooperate uh, with the Ministry of, of Agriculture but also uh, how to um, put in place uh, new solutions uh, collaborating with also with other countries for example with Germany and also with Austria well, as to the next steps. So rapid response on the one hand and also modulated solutions depending on the period of uh, the lockdown. So you talked about uh, the springtime and also the autumn period. So thank you very much also for providing uh, your innovative uh, uh, practices. And now it's uh, the time, uh, the turn of Emma Walsh. Emma Walsh uh, is uh, International Partnership Director of Food Cloud. Ireland, you're very welcome. You will provide us some interesting uh, uh, examples on how to cooperate with charities and how to use technology. You're welcome, Emma. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to participate in the virtual forum today. Um, so Food Cloud runs the National Food Bank Network in Ireland, and we also support food rescue from supermarkets using technology. This year, we have seen a huge increase in the demand for food as a result of COVID. And this has required a lot of changes to our operations as we did our best to meet the rising demand for food and you know, experienced weeks of record high and record low volumes of food coming through our operations in very quick succession as a result of panic buying and then all of the changes that my fellow food bankers have spoken about through um, the disruptions to the, the, the restaurant and catering sectors. In 2020, so far, our technology has supported the rescue of an additional two and a half thousand tons of food or a 40% increase on 2019 levels. Um, but I'm gonna focus on our experience in Ireland. And in Ireland 20, in 2020 so far, our operations have rescued almost 3000 tons of food with our warehouses seeing an incredible 75% increase in the amount of food that went through them. Despite this massive increase, we have still really struggled to keep pace with the demand for food. And I guess one of the most important things that we did during COVID was to engage much more closely with our charity partners and understand their experience. 
we work with the network of charities across Ireland and we, when lockdown first came into effect, we reached out to these partners to understand what changes they anticipated as, as, you know, as a result of the impact of lockdown. And we had a team of remote volunteers and staff jump on the phones and call all of our charities to go through a survey. The results of this survey were so important and they gave us insights that allowed us to take key actions to shape how we operated during this year. We saw that 40% of our charities were forced to close because of the impact of COVID on their operations. So we removed them from our weekly collection schedules and gave these slots to charities that were open and needed more food. Many were worried about funding, so we fundraised and this enabled us to suspend our membership contributions uh, for the, that the charities provide for, to Food Cloud from April 1st until October. Many were unsure about the restrictions and what that meant for them in terms of picking up food. So we issued a letter to all of our charity partners explaining that they were key workers who, and they could show this at checkpoints. We saw lots of charities were providing hampers and food packages and we introduced a new food allocation model where we could deliver bulk quantities easily. And we were inundated with the request from individuals uh, for food, which never had really happened to us before. So we created a map, um, a food link map of all the charities that were open where members of the public could access food. We checked in monthly with our charities to see who was open and closed and if anything has changed, as restriction eased or as time went on. And we did this using a chatbot and this was hugely effective and cut out. So, uh, and I suppose really allowed us to kind of take the pulse of the network and see what was happening. And we found this piece of technology was just um, made a huge um, difference to our operations during COVID. Um, I guess in July, we carried out a, a, a large COVID survey to our network. Um, from this survey, uh, we, we asked lots of different questions about how COVID had impacted the charities and the delivery of their services. But the, the kind of key finding was that 70% of the charities that responded had seen an increase in demand for food during COVID. And this was driven by three main factors, the impact of COVID on household income, uh, closure of schools and loss of community meals and snacks, and then self-isolation. The survey gave us really important information and we were able to share this with our stakeholders. And this had also enabled us to start to tell a little bit about the story of food insecurity in Ireland, which really we found as time went on was not well understood. And a lot of people started to look to us for more information. And um, we would never really have considered ourselves, you know, having expertise in this field, but we asked our charities what was happening and we we aim to tell their story. The increase in demand for food required us to consider other options for food sourcing and it support, I suppose this survey then supported us to launch our first national food appeal, which we named Food for Ireland. And this is the first time where we asked four national retailers to come together and organize um, donations from customers of non-surplus food. I guess because of COVID, we couldn't have um, volunteers in the stores. So the volumes are probably lower than we would have expected, but we were still hugely grateful for all of the food that was collected and really, I suppose, supported us in kind of closing the gap on the uh, demand a little bit. Another important source of non-surplus food is our FIAD program. So we're the managing partner, or we're the partner organization for the food element of FIAD in Ireland. And our role is to procure, store, and redistribute products on behalf of the managing authorities, which is the, the Department of Social Protection. So the type of food provided through FIAD is long life dry goods. And this was really important during COVID because it meant that our charities could quickly change from providing meals and cooking on site to delivering food hampers. So that it, it enabled them to easily change between how, or how they were kind of providing food to their service users. Um, it was really, really important for us to be able to continue to deliver fiat. And I guess one of the first steps we made during COVID was to, I suppose, adapt our own operations to comply, comply with COVID measures. This involved, I suppose, stopping volunteers, splitting shifts and, and hiring extra staff for our warehouses. Um, once we had made those changes, we worked with the managing authority to reach out to all of our charities and understand what charities needed more or less food or were closed. 
and also to understand the demand and range logistics. Uh, and we were able to provide a 25% increase in the quarter three allocations of food delivered through the FIAD program um, for, for 50 of our charities, which was great. I suppose everyone was hit with the challenges of COVID-19 almost simultaneously, but for some, it left them really unsure of where their next meal would come from, either for a short period as they tried to access social welfare payments for the first time, or found themselves suddenly cocooning. Um, or, and some were affected for much longer periods and continue to be affected due to lack of a loss of employment, you know, and, and a range of other challenges, including health and uh, domestic violence. And I, I believe, um, well, I suppose in Food Cloud, we really believe that working with our charities and communities, um, these organizations can quickly step in with food in a crisis. And, and this is really essential because food opens the door to other services. And it, it's a way that we can all reach out to people in our communities. Um, it's an incredible way to provide, I suppose, a sort of safety net to lift morale and build resilience and sol solidarity in communities. Uh, and gathering information from our charities around their activities has been critically important. And we will build on this work for next year so that we can continue to tell their stories and support the organizations that are at the cold face of the crisis. So um, I suppose thank you to everybody who supported us through this kind of remarkable year. And thank you especially to all of the team at FIBA. And we're so grateful for everything that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, also to you and to your experience. Uh, you provided some uh, interesting examples on how to map the needs of charities through to service how technology can enable to implement a more effective food allocation models and logistic model, and how a FEAD program can support you in your operations together with new ways, for example, Food for Ireland, as a new way to, to, to face this huge challenge, which is called COVID, but also food insecurity. So thank you very much also to you, by the way, Let's uh, have a glimpse on the poster. You saw that uh, Marielle uh, is working for us. Uh, he's becoming uh, more populated uh, with info and drawings. Uh, and uh, this is really, really useful for us to, 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 to keep memory on what we listened to till now. For the moment, uh, we are 15 minutes late, um, <laughs> comparing with the program. Uh, no problem. Well, well, let's have to, to, to Yes, to, to, to take a faster pace uh, in the next uh, uh, sessions. And that's the moment to introduce uh, the second uh, stage, uh, the second step of this uh, forum, which is devoted to uh, the next year. So looking at 2021, uh, uh, what are the new policies and funding schemes uh, we will have an update uh, from the European Commission, and that's uh, uh, the occasion to welcome uh, Loris Di Pietrantonio, who is a head of unit uh, of uh, ASF and FEAD policy and legislation uh, from the DG Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion European from the European Commission. Uh, Mr. Loris Di, Di Pietrantonio, the floor is yours. Uh, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. I hope you can uh, all hear me uh, well. But first of all, I need to thank you all for the, for the great event. I think it's always uh, nice and good to be with you and especially to learn uh, uh, so much. I didn't realize we were late on the program because I was captured by the presentations that I heard uh, so far. Uh, they were super interesting. Um, and uh, really, from the depths of my heart and the heart of the European Commission, really thank you for being on the front line. Eh? Somebody defined this as a war. Uh, if we use this, I don't like the war terminology, but if, if we use the same approximation, obviously, you've been really at the front line for a long time with all the challenges that you put forward uh, in the presentations that you had, but also with a lot of resolved resolutions and practical solutions to the, to the challenges. Uh, what we have seen has been uh, dramatic. Uh, uh, some of the speakers also referred that in the queues to the uh, food banks, 
in the queues to the food centers, they were not just the typical target group, which is already bad news, but you know, even worse, there were also like people that are not normally in the target group. And we all know how this crisis has affected not only Europe uh, from an health perspective, but also from a socioeconomic uh, uh, perspective. Uh, it is really uh, for that, that uh, we also as institutions at the European level, we had a major resolve, which was uh, uh, fast. And I'm talking there about, I'll do a bit of history before stepping in into the, the new programs 21, 27, is basically the adaptations of the current uh, regulations where we had back in uh, March, uh, two key modifications, the Corona uh, Virus Response Initiative, uh, number one and number two, all passed in record time. These were two uh, modifications of the rules concerning and including also FEAD, uh, proposed by the Commission and adopted by the co-legislators two weeks later. This was historically uh, uh, really a first time that uh, there was such a spin, speed activated. At that time, we changed the regulation to mobilize as quickly as possible existing liquidity for an amount of 37 uh, uh, billion but also to create and then move a bit more on the fed more flexibility including uh, for the fed and for the other programs for instance like the co-financing rate at 100 percent so basically uh, member states could claim co-financing rate at 100 percent the fed is already a slightly more favorable co-financing rate this was of 85%. This was pushed to 100% because of the emergency. It's kept like that for the period 2014 2020. So, even including uh, the additional modification, which I will introduce uh, in a second. The, the important other modification that we did for FAD uh, back in March and entered into force uh, uh, first days of uh, April was the possibility to use. Uh, paper and electronic vouchers. And this was also done, first of all, because uh, it, it was one of our concerns which we wanted to fix, for instance, with ESF Plus for the next programming period. In a way, we anticipated that into the FED. One of the concerns is obviously stigma. Uh, in a way, people can actually use also the, the vouchers. But the key concern at, at this time was also the, the fact that in, indeed you faced the challenge of having less volunteer on the ground. And some of the member states have also taken that opportunity. So we, for instance, we know that Romania launched uh, a voucher program and France in some regional uh, uh, programs, like for instance, is in the uh, territory of um, uh, Mayotte. Uh, we had an intense activity in terms of modification of the operational programs. Uh, now, uh, I, I don't want to be too detailed, but just to give an idea, uh, we have 886 programs uh, for the ESF. 151 of these programs have been modified to use the flexibilities of the CRE and CRE Plus uh, measures. So these uh, uh, regulatory acts in terms of flexibility to enjoy the 100% uh, co-financing. In FEAD, uh, there we had uh, in total 10 uh, modifications of the programs. Uh, six uh, of these programs uh, asked for 100% uh, co-financing and four programs uh, asked uh, indeed to introduce emergency measures to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, which means also, for instance, allowing protective uh, equip equipment uh, for the people who actually have to uh, provide uh, the services uh, on the ground. Thanks to this measure, FEAD uh, and, um, uh, uh, and DSF uh, uh, all together, we were able to reach on a partial reporting. Eh? So only 40 member states were able so far to report on, uh, on this. We were able to reach 4 million people with uh, our uh, actions, our measures, and obviously with the changed measures of both uh, ESF and, uh, and, uh, and FIAT. But I think this is now, in a way, uh, almost the past. Obviously, this program uh, continues. 
uh, continue. But this is basically what we had, what we have done, what we are doing uh, so far at the very precise uh, moment, uh, starting from uh, uh, March uh, of this year. Uh, I want to come to the future, and, and this is basically why you see also these are company slides, which I promise only temporarily substitutes for the wonderful tree that I saw growing uh, with discussions and reportings from, uh, from the forum today. So if we talk about the future, we talk about 21, 27, but this future is also important for the current programs uh, of today, and I explain uh, uh, why. I think there the commission, but also the colleges later uh, uh, took an historical uh, step because basically uh, because of the emergency, they were able to find the political willingness to basically almost double the, the usual budget that we have. And the usual budget that we have will be the, the columns, the boxes that you would see on the left hand side of this slide. This is called technically the multi-annual financial uh, uh, framework. This is basically the seven-year budget which we always negotiated uh, every seven years. And this has the amount uh, of 1 billion, uh, 73, 74 uh, billion, uh, 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 um, one trillion, sorry, <laughs> 1,074 uh, billion uh, uh, euro. Uh, now, within uh, that part, what is important from a cohesion point of view, from a cohesion policy point of view, whether it is a territorial cohesion or a policy cohesion uh, uh, drive, it's this 377 billion euro. And within that, 88 billion euro are for the new ESF uh, plus. Uh, I will uh, talk about the new ESF uh, plus. Let's keep it in mind for the moment, because obviously within the new ESF plus, there will be also funding in support of ex fiat measures, so for food provision and basic material assistance. What is really new uh, in terms of uh, budgetary support, in terms of uh, financial effort, and in terms of uh, political drive that occurred uh, this time, is what you see on the right hand side uh, of the presentation. And this is basically the next generation uh, uh, EU. This is what uh, uh, somebody calls the Hamil Hamiltonian moment of the European uh, Union, because behind this, there is obviously a program, an instrument, which is the European recovery instrument, which would allow the European Commission to go to the markets and issue uh, bonds uh, to obtain 750 billion additional uh, funding. Now, most of it will go to this uh, recovery and resilience uh, facility, so for 672.5 billion, which will help member states, uh, in fact, cater for uh, both reforms, but also the twin challenge of green and digital, so on the ground. But I think what is important there on the right hand, hand, hand column uh, is also what we call REACT uh, EU. And this is basically a vehicle which will draw 47.5 billion euro from this next generation EU. So basically this is money that comes from the financial markets through the issuance of bonds and provides refueling of the current period, so 2014-2020. Why is this important? Because this will allow to refuel the existing programs without any cut to some extent. And we all know that the existing programs, we call it period 2014-2020, but obviously the execution of the current programs go up until 2020. Three. Hmm? So basically, we have the current programs which will be refueled by 47.5 billion. And these are uh, this new fresh money will go into the direction of ESF and the RDF, what you see at the bottom, 2014 2020. But also, we made it possible that the FAIR current programs without disruptions 
can be uh, refueled. And uh, uh, the feedback that we got from uh, the member states is that basically virtually all member states are thinking of refueling the current uh, fiat uh, because obviously there is need on the ground, the need that obviously you highlighted uh, uh, so far. And this is uh, uh, what I consider uh, also a rapid uh, reaction because it will be additional resources which we were not foreseen, foreseen before. They are made available to the current uh, uh, programs, to the current Fed, and they're made available basically on top of what we see as the new budget for DSF uh, uh, plus of the future which is basically this uh, 88 billion uh, effort, also including uh, provision uh, of food and basic material ass assistance, as well as social uh, integration of the most uh, uh, deprived. Now, if, uh, there, if we were in better conditions from a political point of view, that is to say that the council and the parliament would have agreed already last week, <laughs> Uh, on DSF Plus, I would be happier, in fact, to tell you what will be in it precisely. And that, that unfortunately, this is my frustration these days. This consensus does not emerge uh, between the Council uh, and, uh, and the Parliament, especially uh, on the thematic concentrations. I must say they, they've done a wonderful uh, work, a wonderful job in terms of agreeing uh, most of the rules which are basically settled in terms of programming but when we come to the actual thematic concentrations the sort of small constraints that we propose the, uh, within the regulation on how to spend the money and on which priority to spend the money there the council and the parliament are still uh, discussing uh, i hope they will converge in january obviously we're putting pressure that they will have to converge uh, in January, obviously, because programming has to start uh, in a steadfast uh, uh, way. And there, uh, if we come uh, to uh, uh, the so-called ex uh, uh priorities, that is to say the new specific objectives, 10 and 11, the 10 is on social in integration of the most deprived, and the specific objective 11 within the SF Plus is on uh, uh, food uh, provision and basic material uh, assistance uh, provision. There you well know that our proposal was to have a 2% earmarked uh, of DSF Plus to be uh, uh, spent on these two specific uh, uh, objectives. Uh, this is also the line uh, of the Council. The Parliament wants more obviously because they they're also concerned uh, with the situation and they they strive for a three uh, uh, percent uh, of expenditure in um, uh, impaired and they strive for a three percent on top of the 25 percent for social inclusion so as you see there there is a lot of discussion uh, the Commission uh, cannot but uh, facilitate. We think that our proposal was also struck a bit in the anticipating the two sides struck in the in the middle. But obviously now the the ball is entirely in the co-legislators' uh, role. Just a reminder for everybody: the Commission makes proposal, but it's not a co-legislator. The co-legislators uh, are the Council and the Parliament. My big wish is that they will come forth with the best decision uh, in, uh, uh, in January. The best decision, obviously, not for the Council and Parliament and the institutions, the best decision for the people in, uh, in, uh, in January, and especially uh, in a steadfast way, because we need to start programming on the ground. And we really need to uh, act uh, 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 together on the ground also for the years 21-27. Now, the reassuring part of it is that because we have React U, we have additional funding already in the current programs, so there will not be a disruption. And also the new rules, which will obviously take some delay in terms of entry, entry into force. Our wish, even before the crisis uh, occurred, was to have these rules already in force by 1st of January. 2021, this is obviously not possible because uh, uh, the, there was a delay, there was a new proposal for the MFF, 
there was a new proposal for the next generation uh, EU. Nonetheless, the new rules will set the date of eligibility to 1st of January 2021. And this is obviously something that would help, uh, uh, even if programs come late, would help in recovering expenditures already done as from uh, 1st uh, uh, January 2021. Uh, um, I think I'll conclude at that. I really thank the organizers and I'm always astonished to how much you can learn also technology-wise. So also thanks for the wonderful uh, interpretations uh, in Interaxio, which work super fine. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Di, P Di Pietrantonio. Uh, you, you started your intervention with some keywords, uh, both positive and negative. Uh, you started with uh, the words uh, challenges, dramatic situations, health, but also social economic crisis. But soon after, you introduced also keywords like resolutions, practical solutions, and fast response. And uh, rightly, to, in order to boost uh, this uh, uh, faster and effective response, uh, you introduced uh, some important modifications uh, uh, on the FEAD program, uh, and uh, you provided some very good news, uh, or, uh, talking about uh, the, the next uh, um, period, 2021-2017. Uh, uh, um, this is an historical moment also because you doubled the budget uh, on the MFF, but also uh, you provided some good news uh, in terms of additional resources uh, in order to support food bankers, uh, which are already well equipped uh, with competencies and also creativity, as we listened before, in order to find out new solutions uh, uh, for food security. Um, thank you very much because you demonstrated that institutions are key partners uh, in what we are doing in FIBA Network and thanks again for your intervention. Thank you. Now it's the moment to, to open the third stage of the event, which is about uh, uh, two uh, uh, panelists, two speakers. They will share a slide presentation and they will help us uh, to uh, understand uh, uh, how to implement a holistic approach uh, in growing cities. So we come back to uh, practical situations, uh, bearing in mind uh, that uh, cities are increasing uh, and citizens might play a key role um, uh, in order to, to face uh, this uh, um, critical situation. I welcome the two speakers uh, who are Roberta Sonnino, Professor of Environmental Policy and Planning uh, uh, in Carding at Cardiff, Cardiff University, as well as uh, Paul Milburn, Professor of Human Geography um, from the same university, Cardiff University. Uh, the two speakers uh, will help us uh, to understand how the COVID-19 crisis has given visibility to the dysfunctionalities of the food system, but uh, uh, um, apart from the limitations uh, of the performance-based food governance, uh, they will highlight how a holistic approach uh, is uh, um, really, really necessary in order to facilitate also the transition to a fairer and more democratic food system. You're both welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks to FIBA for the invitation to this really important discussion. Um, I'm going to start the first part of this PowerPoint and then hand over uh, to Paul in the second part. And I'd like to start, if we can move to the first slide, with uh, some simple images that the COVID pandemic has uh, placed on the table and that we'll always remember as food researcher in particular, I'll always remember the um, images of produce left to rotten in the fields due to the lack of migrant labor and the inability of migrant workers to travel, particularly to Southern European countries. Uh, next to images of longer and longer queues of people at food banks all over the world. Next slide, please. For me, uh, those two very simple images act uh, as a powerful reminder that hunger, like all other forms of malnutrition, is not 
an isolated problem. It's not the kind of problem that can be solved through uh, narrow targeted forms of intervention. Hunger, food poverty are always indicative of other underlying socio-ecological problems that often evoke other grand challenges of our time, climate change, water scarcity, loss of biodiversity, and also we'll hear from Paul later on about this, of course, poverty. Next slide, please. Um, these figures uh, attempt to show uh, that what I'm really talking about here is the strong correlation that exists between food security and socio-environmental security, or in other words, between levels of income and employment, the availability of flows and stocks of natural resources, and the ability of a population to feed itself healthily. There's no doubt in my mind that our progress in the fight against hunger, against food insecurity, will ultimately depend on our capacity, not just as researchers, but our capacity as policymakers, as practitioners, as food bankers, to systemically engage with this very complex picture. Next slide, please. And this is where city governments come in the picture. We learn from many uh, speakers before me that some of the most exciting responses uh, to COVID have emerged in urban areas. I'm thinking about Milan, for example, um, and other uh, European cities that have been very creative in responding to the COVID crisis. Um, as researchers, we have been, uh, we've been very excited about uh, what city governments have been doing to transform the food system in the last decade. We have particularly praised the capacity of many city governments on the ground to develop synergies across the food system, uh, synergies between diverse stakeholders, synergies between traditionally disjointed policy domains, I am indeed involved at this point in time in a very exciting large innovation project coordinated by the city of Milan, which is entirely built around uh, the uh, systemic approach to food that only city governments uh, seem to be able to have. So uh, we have all been part of this renewed urban optimism, as I call it in this slide, um, which has very good reasons to exist. Um, we need to continue to support city actions because it's in cities that we have witnessed the emergence of a range of innovative practices that have, for example, as I wrote in this slide, innovative practices that are supporting more joined up food policies, innovative practices that have enhanced the participation of civil society in food governance, innovative practices that are incentivizing multi-actor collaborations and knowledge exchange. Uh, some of the practices that food bankers introduced before me are a very good example of what I'm talking about here. Now, next slide, please. I see a little bit of a danger though, uh, in that a lot of the proposed solutions, particularly when it comes to the COVID crisis, a lot of the proposed solutions are um, developing a narrative that perhaps is fetishizing the urban. It's reducing it to a, an abstract, discrete category that somewhat exists in isolation prior to or as a background against people's lives. And one example of this tendency I'm worried about is the use of global governance idioms such as resilient or smart cities, for example. Uh, these are idioms that are giving prominence to aggregated data, arbitrary thresholds, performance indicators, techno-managerial fixes. Next slide, please. We all know, many of us on this call know, that performance-based governance and evidence-based policy are inadequate. They are inadequate because they are unable, unable to capture informality the many informal flows of people, ideas, knowledge, resources that characterize the urban metabolism and that provide a major challenge 
to the quantification of urban food systems for evidence-based policy making. Next slide, please. What I'm saying is that notions of resilient or smart cities don't help us to address the root causes of the crisis we are all experiencing, the root causes of inequality and environmental degradation. Resilience and smartness don't tell us much, for example, about the role of power, the role of formal and informal power structures in shaping the relationship that a city has with food. To be politically meaningful, the urban food agenda, the so-called urban food agenda needs to start engaging with issues of difference and power. We need to be a bit more courageous and start to consider and contest the role of global agribusinesses and profit-driven multinational conglomerates that continue to shape the urban food environment in complicated ways. Next slide, please. So my key message for today, uh, for my part of this presentation, is that the next phase of research and policy action will need to engage with power dynamics and will need to problematize notions of participation and inclusiveness, which we tend to use a bit too casually. We'll need to start asking critical questions to understand whose concerns are really prioritized and whose concerns are rendered invisible in our cities. We'll need to ask questions about whose voice is heard and who is remaining silent in all of these conversations about the COVID crisis and responses to it. We need to start asking questions about who is empowered but also disempowered by the unfolding of this new urban agenda. To be truly transformative, as I wrote in this slide, we need an urban food agenda that empowers citizens, that places them in the position of producing the urban, that moves beyond the specific ways of knowing that are encapsulated in the dominant smart or resilient narratives. And we need to start drawing upon the different knowledges, experiences, political priorities, of what are actually very diverse urban communities, very diverse urbanities, some of which we all know are completely disengaged, if not marginalized from this renewed urban optimism. Over to Paul now um, to uh, pick on issues of power and uh, in relation to broader ideals of food poverty, food justice, and a potential role that food banks uh, could play in addressing these issues, in our view. Okay, uh, thanks, Roberta. Good, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where, where you're sitting at the moment. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, at, at this really important conference. And as Roberta has said, what I want to do is, is, is follow on those themes that she's introduced uh, by uh, thinking about uh, some of the linkages between food and poverty, what I'm going to call food poverty, uh, and also thinking about um, the current and future roles of food banks in tackling that food poverty uh, and doing what Roberta was talking about, empowering uh, marginalised groups uh, and communities. And I should just say, when I use the term food bank, uh, I guess I'm referring to a broad range of organisations providing emergency uh, food uh, to uh, people in poverty. I'll start with this slide, which I'm not going to go into any detail uh, about, but it just gives you a flavor of what I'm talking about in terms of some of the food uh, dimensions um, of poverty. How I guess living on a low income is associated with people struggling to pay for basic foods, uh, unable to afford uh, regular meals or to eat out with friends and family. And I think it also shows in terms of the context of this conference, uh, the rapidly increasing demand uh, for emergency food uh, uh, assistance. Uh, during the time of COVID. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of what I'm thinking about when I, I, I use the term uh, food uh, poverty, well, um, I'm thinking, yes, about biological needs and the denials of those needs in relation to um, basic diets and adequate uh, nutrition. But I'm also thinking about uh, the, the social and the cultural significance of food. Um, the way it plays a central life uh, within our roles. 
And as one participant in some of the research I've been doing on food poverty in the UK put it, it's not just about missing a meal, that it's not being able to have the birthday cake uh, for your uh, child's uh, birthday. It's also clear that um, a lack of food, hunger, food poverty needs to be seen as a manifestation rather than a cause um, of poverty. That solutions to food poverty need to go beyond the realms um, of food. Thirdly, I think we need to pluralize uh, the term food poverty. We're talking about a wide variety of situations um, of food poverty, of which um, relying on a food bank or, or charitable organizations for, for emergency food is, is one part of that continuum or one um, extreme of that continuum. Because the reality is that you know, the, the people using food banks are very much the tip of the iceberg um, called food poverty, that the vast majority of people experiencing uh, food poverty uh, do not make use um, of uh, emergency uh, food organizations. Next slide, please. So in terms of evidencing uh, food poverty, this is not the straightforward task that um, I, as an academic researcher, uh, yourselves as practitioners, uh, would want it to be. Uh, I guess uh, for three um, simple reasons. One, uh, food poverty largely remains hidden uh, from view. It's, it's about the individual. Uh, it's about being restricted uh, to people's uh, private households. Secondly, although there's been a lot of good work done, um, by academics and others um, to evidence uh, food poverty, uh, there are still some problems uh, in terms of doing that. Official statistics are not that great um, for uh, measuring uh, food poverty. Different definitions are used. Uh, there's not a lot of consistency um, across countries in terms of the way they do that. Within the academic research, there's very much a bias towards uh, studies in North America uh, and to a lesser extent, the UK. Within those studies, the main focus has been on what we might see as the, the most visible manifestations um, of food poverty, uh, namely uh, food banks. And within that work, um, there has been uh, much less attention given to what we might call the everyday lived experience, experiences of food poverty. And as Roberta said, there's a need to, uh, to expose, to reveal uh, those uh, lived experiences um, of being at the bottom of the food system, at the bottom of uh, um, the, the income charts. So that's the second uh, reason why I think it's difficult to evidence food poverty. The third one uh, relates uh, to uh, these political silences on food poverty. I think until relatively re recently, uh, food poverty has not been something that has, has grabbed the headlines in terms of news in various countries. I think that's starting to change now. And part of the reason why uh, there's been this political silence is um, the lack of representation um, of low-income groups, of those uh, people experiencing uh, food poverty. And again, to quote one of the partic participants in my own research, you know, where is the political voice uh, for those people uh, reliant on food banks experiencing food poverty? Uh, the next slide, please. So moving on to tackling uh, food poverty, and it's, it's clear to me that um, there are these, what I call competing uh, political framings um, of food poverty and the way we respond to it. Uh, and this quote from an article by Amy Healy, I think uh, shows this uh, quite nicely. So that if we think about food poverty as some people uh, lacking uh, access to food, then it's pretty clear that the appropriate response to that is to provide those people with more food. If we think about food poverty in broader and more critical terms uh, in relation to being denied basic rights to food, in relation to social injustices, social exclusion, then the solution uh, to that food poverty is itself broader uh, and more critical um, and lies uh, with uh, public policy uh, and government interventions. But what I see across many countries um, uh, in Europe um, and uh, in the developed world is uh, a very much a focus on food redistribution um, as a solution um, to poverty. The dominant narrative 
seems to be about surplus food redistribution, rather than thinking about how we can contribute more generally uh, to anti-poverty and social inclusionary policies that raise income levels uh, that protect uh, our poorest citizens. And I see a rather sort of worrying moral discourse uh, developing uh, in relation to you know, some of these uh, terms in uh, these phrases in the quotations here, um, seeing the solution uh, to food poverty as providing uh, leftover food uh, for leftover people. And, and I think what follows from, from these, these unhelpful moral di discourses uh, is very much a depoliticization um, of uh, food poverty, seeing food poverty or the solutions to food poverty uh, in logistical terms uh, rather uh, than lying in the realms of uh, politics um, and more critical uh, public policy. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, moving on to uh, food banking and um, thinking um, about uh, the current situation. Um, what I would like to begin by saying is I think you're all performing a really valuable function uh, in terms of uh, responding uh, to hunger. I think you're all doing a great job in raising the political profile um, of uh, food poverty uh, in different countries. But we need to be a little bit careful that uh, in raising the profile of uh, food poverty, um, we don't forget about um, those other forms um, of food poverty uh, that go beyond uh, you making use um, of food banks. I think there's also a danger that uh, food banks become some form of taken for granted entity uh, within what we might call um, the, austerity, the austerity landscape that, we, that we're living in at the moment. They become institutionalized, the puppets of government, they become normalized. They are seen as the expected response uh, to dealing with food poverty. And it's also clear that we've got some rather complex relationships going on between food banks um, and governments. Um, many um, are working uh, with progressive uh, city governments uh, to develop coordinated uh, responses to food poverty. Many also recognize uh, that they're there filling the gaps that are being left as the state increasingly withdraws uh, from providing uh, key aspects of uh, welfare provision uh, to disadvantaged groups uh, within uh, society. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? But looking forward, which is what I think we're, we're trying to do in this second part of, of the conference, I think the time is right uh, to think um, uh, more creatively, differently uh, about uh, the future of food banking. I think as we start to reflect on what COVID means for us uh, in relation to society uh, and policy responses, as we begin to engage with uh, the European Commission's really exciting agenda um, in terms of uh, farm to fork uh, strategy and trying to bring uh, a just transition uh, to the sustainable food system, then I think we need to think more broadly about what food banks are currently doing uh, and what they can do uh, in the future. And I think it's it's time to contest, politely contest, um, the idea that food banks can't respond more broadly and creatively uh, to uh, food poverty. I think it's time to see food banks as very much community resources, community hubs, resource centers. And again, to quote uh, from one of my own respondents in the work I've been doing, People using food banks want much more than handouts. They want, to they want to develop relationships. They want advice, they want support, they want to connect with people. Um, they want to find pathways out of poverty. And I think there's a real um, valuable role for food banks in terms of doing that. And the same in terms of developing new relationships um, with and uh, through uh, food, making more use of different types of food, fresher, more nutritious, locally produced sustainable products, to engage with others within the food system, uh, growing food. I do a lot of work on urban community gardens and that's what I'm thinking about there. To think about how we can move beyond food distribution to develop relationships that bring people together uh, to cook um, and to eat uh, collectively. To think about the shared narratives of food, the ability of food to bring different groups together, to think also about the power of food 
um, to shape um, people's lives uh, in positive terms. And my final slide, please. In fact, my penultimate slide. Um, so I think what I'm actually talking about here is the ways in which we, we need to recognize, I guess, that at the moment, food banks um, may be seen as rather peripheral actors within the conventional food system. But if we think about a food, the food system differently, we think about food system transformation, then I think we've got to see food banks as more central actors, as potential catalysts for food system transformation. And going back to some of the themes that Roberta was talking about, to see food banks as able to, to re-engage, to empower, and to activate uh, margin, marginalized citizens. And I, I uh, believe me, the, this is the next uh, and final slide of our presentation. Um, just to finish on this, um, because you know I'm an academic, so I, I talk sometimes in theoretical terms, I talk about ideals. But as Roberta said, we're working on a, on a big Horizon 2020 project, identifying examples of innovative projects. Um, but also from my work on community gardening, and this is an example of that uh, from uh, a case study in Toronto in Canada, you can see the, sort, the sorts of things that certain projects uh, are starting to develop, beginning with the food bank, uh, thinking uh, more imaginatively, more broadly, more critically, engaging with others, um, and as we talked about at the start of the presentation, um, re-engaging, empowering um, citizens uh, through uh, food activity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to you both. Uh, it was a really systematic uh, presentation and uh, it was uh, particularly precious at the end of uh, this, uh, this program because uh, you provided us uh, some uh, really, really inspiring, uh, but also um, say stimulating uh, inputs. Uh, Roberta Sonnino talked about uh, hunger and she said that hunger is a never isolated problem. That's completely true. Uh, and uh, we, we might consider the cities uh, like uh, powerful laboratories to look at power dynamics uh, and through the lenses of food insecurity, take into account also how to empower citizens, how to uh, treat uh, the dynamics of powers, how to reinvent uh, or to consider in, in a different perspective the role of food banks, for example, and how to treat uh, the marginalization. So food poverty is never only a matter of biological needs, we know. It's also a matter of social value of food in terms of self-isolation, sharing, and food and health poverty. That's, uh, that's what you said, uh, also Paul Milburn, the time is right to think in a creative way. And uh, that's why probably uh, FIBA wanted to title this important forum uh, uh, with uh, these uh, keywords. Uh, European Food Banks Federation competencies and creativity to feed the future. So I think it's the best way to close the cycle. And now we have uh, the possibility to have a glimpse on uh, the poster drawn by uh, um, our graphic recorder, Marielle Binken. This is a uh, really, really impressive. Uh, have a look to it and we could use it as a base to, yes, yes, to, 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 to bear in mind what we listen from all the speakers and panelists uh, of this morning. And this is uh, the moment to ask questions. Uh, please uh, use uh, your Q&A uh, section uh, in the chat, uh, um, pushing the chat button. Uh, you can write uh, some questions uh, uh, or comments. Uh, and if you've got uh, some specific question to address uh, to a particular panelist or speaker, please write the name of the speaker to whom you want to ask, uh, address your question. So that's the time to, to interact in this way. The first uh, reaction is this one from Luigi Leonori. 
uh, he writes, uh, please never dissociate uh, food poverty by health poverty because uh, they are absolutely connected. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, I ask to the speakers, uh, feel free to react to these comments. Yes, if, if I may, uh, I think uh, a constant uh, a constant motto today, not only in this forum, but also at the General Assembly of the, of the European Food Bank Federation, has been that we do not, well, we, we have to deal with food insecurity, but we must uh, write ourselves into the conversation of food as a holistic problem. And obviously, the, the, um, it has an impact uh, on poverty. We are not specialists in poverty solution. We are specialists, traditionally, we are specialists in relieving one of the aspects of poverty. But um, the, and, and, and also, uh, you know, I never uh, miss an opportunity to, to say how uh, food, especially in the growing age, uh, you know, between zero and 20 years of age, how this is important for the health, not only physical health, but also for mental health, for the development of the brain and so on. The quality of food is so important. So yes, uh, I, I would uh, certainly uh, comfort our uh, listener and our participant there um, and, and say, I fully agree with him. And um, uh, this is, I think, uh, a, an avenue that food banks will have to walk pretty soon, is to get involved with the food problem as an issue and a holistic issue, not only as food insecurity. And I believe, for example, that the education, public education and things like that would, could well become new challenges for food bankers. Um, obviously, uh, I would say like uh, uh, Paul did, when I talk food bankers, I would say I would in, embrace also the charities to which food banks are supplying food, but maybe we can supply as food banks, as we intended to be, we can supply other things than food to the charities. We can supply education, we can supply, um, uh, we can supply uh, knowledge, uh, we can supply the avenue to, to change the, the dialogue between society uh, and the, the, the persons who, who find themselves in a situation or in precarious situation or in food poverty. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, for your uh, answer, for your response. Uh, there's another question uh, coming from uh, the Food Bank of Estonia. Uh, and the question is uh, addressed to uh, Professor Paul Milburn. And the question is, um, have you more examples on practices of community inclusion by food banks? I have, whether, whether I've got the time to talk about them, uh, to respond to the question um, is, is, is another question itself. Um, I, so so a, a lot of these uh, examples are coming out um, of, of the project we mentioned before, um, looking at um, um, this in relation to the, the food trails um, project that Roberta mentioned. I guess um, it, it's about rather than giving out um, packages of food to individuals and letting them go home to do whatever with that food. It's about trying to uh, use food to, to bring people together. Um, there, there are, for example, food banks that are developing communal kitchens uh, that are, are encouraging people to come together uh, to, 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 to cook. And, and to share food. It's those sort of things. I mean, I clearly, if, uh, if that person gets in touch with me um, uh, beyond this call, I, I, I can provide more information. 
um, to that. But in, in general terms, it's just, it's thinking differently. Uh, it's trying to move away from um, the, these problems being individualized and giving out food in an individualized uh, manner to try and bring people together to, to, as I said before, to use food as a shared narrative to bring different groups together uh, to talk about um, shared issues, shared problems, and, and hopefully um, come together to think about also shared solutions. Thank you very much. Now we've got a, another question coming from Kartik Reich. I do apologize for the pronunciation. I'm not so sure to, 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 to pronounce in the right way. Uh, Human Rights Watch for FIBA Secretary General or for FIBA members who spoke from country context. And the question is, uh, to what extent uh, is talking about addressing food poverty or insecurity helped by talking about the right to food or the right uh, to an adequate standard of living? Can this help uh, shift focus on government's obligations to their citizens so charities and food bankers aren't left filling the gap? So it's a question about the roles. I'm, I'm happy to make a comment on that, Laura, if you'd like. Yes, um, please. Yeah, so I, I would say, first of all, um, this year, I think, in Ireland, we definitely discovered how little we know about this in a national context. And I think Paul's presentation was just so interesting and resonated with so many of our learnings during the year. What we found, so I, I think we're a long way from understanding, in an Irish context anyway, you know, the impact of talking about the right to food or that the right to an adequate standard of living. I actually don't even think that we fully understand it. And, and Ireland may be an exception to this. I don't even think we fully understand the extent to which, you know, we, ha we have food po or poverty or food insecurity. Should we talk about food poverty or should we be talking about food insecurity? What are the dimensions we should look at? And I think that's why my intervention really focused on the engagement that we had with our charity partners. We know that we need to find out more information about this because during the crisis, people looked to us as Food Cloud to talk about the problem of food insecurity and to talk about the food problem of food poverty in Ireland. And the first thing we saw was that, you know, we, we, we just didn't have good data that we could even represent our, 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 our charity partners with. We They knew what was happening on the ground, but even getting enough information about the demand for food. So I guess there's a lot of work for us to do and there's a lot of work for us, uh, and just to echo the president, I think there's a lot of work for us to, I suppose, be more involved in, in, in understanding this space because you know, there is more that food banks can do. And I suppose a couple of the things that we're looking to do for next year is we're looking for partners to, to, to I suppose, help us on this journey. We, we, we want to start to talk more about the, what's been experienced because without shining a light on this, uh, on the fact that, you know, we, we, we had people ask us, where do you find all the hungry people? You know, and, and that's, I suppose, that was shocking. So there's not an understanding of that people are struggling to access food. There's not an understanding, I suppose, of why that's happening. And, and until we start that conversation, we can't, you know, influence governments to, to, to help us on that journey. Um, to, and we, can, we, we don't know, I suppose, we, we don't know what interventions we need to make really to, 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 to make a difference. So I think w one thing that we'd like to look at is to try and size the demand for food. We spoke to, um, some of the team in McKinsey who worked with Feeding America and the States to kind of model the demand that was experienced in, in different areas in, in the US. Um, we'd like to do some, some of that research. We'd also like to, you know, um, kind of publish a report with the actual data that we've collected from the charities year in the year and add to it with our annual survey at the start of next year. And I think the biggest thing that we can do as food banks is to, I suppose, with other partners, not just by ourselves, but with partners and with our community groups to, I suppose, talk about what we found in order to start that conversation and point people, you know, to this area and, and I suppose have a progressive discussion on how we can come together to make it make a change. Thank you, Emma. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, you are absolutely right, and we share uh, what, what you said. Uh, it's an important uh, uh, moment also for that reasons uh, you explained. 
uh, have a look to the poster. I think uh, it's uh, it's time to 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 get to the end of the forum. Uh, we started uh, with five minutes late, and now we are at one uh, ten twelve past. One, this is a very good news because we respected the times and I, I thank you very much all the speakers about to have a look at the poster uh, realized by Marielle Binken. This is a wonderful, this poster together with the proceedings of the forum will be published on, a, on our website <clears throat> at the really beginning of the year. So uh, you won't miss anything about what you listened uh, this morning and what you saw uh, through the presentations. Uh, uh, this is an important thing because uh, it will be, uh, we, we hope, uh, so food for your thought and uh, it will provide a basis uh, for a further dialogue and cooperation between the different uh, subjects uh, uh, engaged uh, in this uh, important challenge. Um, so let me, let me uh, try to summarize uh, so many uh, insightful contributions uh, um, to, to, to do a very quick uh, and simple, I do ap apologize for that uh, wrap up of what we saw and what we listened. Uh, President uh, Jacques Van den Skrik introduced uh, um, the forum uh, talking about uh, uh, the challenges, but also the opportunities provided uh, by this pandemic time and uh, in order to face uh, this period uh, the keywords of uh, the forum or the title of the forum uh, are competencies creativity and but also uh, new solutions and uh, the two keywords uh, he used particularly uh, were donation and sharing uh, this is an important starting point from this starting point veronica tofolutti introduced provided us a scenario about the challenges but also the opportunities in terms of rethinking the agricultural system in europe then we had the chance to listen and to um, have a, a, to shed a light on some innovative practices already put in place in five different countries and for that, we thank uh, Paola Capodristrias, Marco Lucchini, uh, Balash Che, Veronica Lakova, and Emma Walsh, of course, uh, for providing us uh, insightful and inspiring examples, uh, but also innovative solutions. And then we had some uh, good news uh, coming from uh, the European Commissions in terms of uh, uh, additional and even doubled financial resources uh, for the period 2021-2027, uh, 2017, uh, and 27th, and this is important because uh, it's a very uh, um, uh, concrete uh, base uh, from which to start uh, in order to boost and to reinforce uh, uh, the operations of food banks, uh, of course, uh, and all uh, the ecosystem of partners uh, inside the supply chain. And then we have uh, the final presentations uh, of uh, Roberta Sonnino and Paul Milburn. They, um, uh, they closed the cycle. Uh, if I can say like that, uh, because uh, they um, paid attention on the social exclusion and justice uh, um, issues uh, together with the private sphere of food poverty and health poverty, um, stressing uh, the passage uh, that uh, people need, first of all, relations uh, and not just food. And that's why uh, I think it's a very good way to close the cycle because we come back to the um, to the uh, introduction of our president uh, who talked about rightly donation and sharing. So I stop here. I don't want you to, to, uh, to, to talk longer because uh, I really want to open the floor uh, to our president Jacques Van der Skrik uh, for the closing remarks. And I thank you all of you very much. Um, President, you should unmute your microphone, please. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you. Um, so I will be very, very brief. As the last, the last thing I want you to do today is to get hungry. Uh, the 
First of all, I would like to thank all the participants, the speakers, obviously. It was a very thought-provoking uh, two hours. We need that type of medicine and perhaps more than once a year. Um, and I, I thank them very, very much for, for their contribution. I thank the designer in chief, Marielle Blinken. I mean, she gave me, she changed the color of my hair. That is a very good news. And uh, uh, I think if she doesn't have uh, a copyright on, on, the, on the design, on the beautiful tomato trees and, and all these suns uh, going around, um, I would like uh, us to to be able to use it as a Christmas card. I think it would um, it would allow us to uh, to have a look uh, back and to reflect on on the content, extremely rich content of today. So I finally uh, would like to close this uh, this forum by wishing you all a. a uh, uh, very happy Christmas, happy Hanukkah, so I don't forget yeah. anybody, and um, uh, uh, happy New Year. Um, and uh, uh, I would obviously fail anything uh, if I didn't uh, give a big thank you virtual, otherwise I would have given her a big kiss to Laura uh, on, uh, on moderating our uh, proceedings in a very, uh, in the most apt fashion. So thank you very much and have a good end of the year. Bye-bye. Thanks also to the interpreters, our angels. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Bye. I always, I always forget something. <laughs>